Good evening, everyone. We're about to get started. Hello, I'm, my name is Rachel Mizuno and I serve as the Director of Next Generation here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. On behalf of the Council, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this Friday evening. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. We engage not only the, the nation's and the world's top leaders, but also Chicago's next generation of leaders with programming to increase their global fluency and cultural competency. We hope and we welcome all of you tonight to this evening's program and we will welcome you to stay for a reception after the program. We'll be offering complimentary refreshments to all of our guests tonight and we look forward to meeting each of you. Before we get started, uh, a few housekeeping remarks. The council is an independent and nonpartisan platform Views expressed by individuals are, um, that we host are their own and do not represent the institution's positions or views. Please silence your phones, but not your voices. And this event is on the record. So we encourage quiet tweeting uh, and other social, social media engagement throughout the event. Thank you to our members in uh, advance of today's program. Your support is critical to our work. And if you're not a member, please consider joining. We are currently recruiting for our Emerging Leaders program and applications can be found on our website. Later, we will take audience questions through uh, microphones around the room as well as your, through your phone's browser. So you'll see uh, if you go to chicnf.io, you can submit a question at any point during the program. I would really love to extend our deepest gratitude to the team at the Aspen Socrates program for their incredible support and, and assistance with tonight's program, particularly Katie uh, and Cordell Carter in the back. So our, folk, our friends from Aspen are here. This is a joint program uh, with the Aspen Socrates program and you'll have the chance to hear from Cordell later tonight. Now, to say a few more words about the topic, our partner, I'd like to introduce our partner, um, John de Blasio, who's the founder and executive director of GDP Charitable Trust and a board member at the council. He was also an emerging leader um, from 2011 to 2013, and we are incredibly uh, grateful for John's um, donation that has helped us organize this powerful event tonight. So I'll return to moderate Q&A, but I would love to welcome you now to John de Blasio. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. You know, um, uh, Rachel was talking about the Socrates program and the Emerging Leader program, and um, I participated in both. And uh, a few years ago, I said uh, to the team, I said, this is such a natural fit, these two programs, because they're really uh, looking to take young uh, leaders who have a great deal of uh, potential and expand their horizons and build networks and create collaborative uh, um, value. And that's what the GPD Charitable Trust has uh, as our ethos is that we try to create networks of networks to drive um, uh, collaboration around um, thought leadership in, in national security policy. And what uh, putting this partnership together, uh, we've had three years where we've had uh, emerging leaders uh, from the Chicago Council selected that attend the Socrates program in Aspen. Uh, now I think we've had uh, nine of them. Lincoln Ellis is here tonight. Andy Zemanitis is here and I think uh, really represent uh, those those um, leaders who fit very well in that Aspen uh, um, uh, ideals along with the Chicago Council. I also should mention that the uh, the founders of the Chicago Council and those who have been involved for a long time uh, had also been very instrumental in founding the Aspen Institute. So um, we have we, we sort of share the same DNA. Um, you know, tonight uh, what we're going to talk a little bit about is w what is America's place in the world and. It's a very interesting time. I mean, America first and a lot of the changes that come with this idea of what uh, Trumpian philosophy means um, kind of echo out there and reflect back both to the world, back to the United States, and then from our 
uh, uh, public to the world. And it, it's really an undefined territory, and I'm not sure if anybody sat down, they could exactly define it. But, you know, I want to give a, a small anecdote. I was um, with a, a business colleague of mine in Guadalajara uh, last weekend, and he does a lot of work in China. And he talks about China, and he says, you know, uh, I think it's, it's a great system. Um, you know, they may not uh, be treating their public fairly or in certain ways, but, but boy, what a, what a great system. They've got roads that work, and they've been able to build this and do this. And, uh, you know, it, was, it, it, it reminded me of, of uh, Dick Longworth here who said, when I was in Moscow in the 60s, uh, we took the competition of ideas seriously. We were competing with this idea of communism. They believed in it. Right? And I think we're losing that edge of what does America stand for, and we forget that. And uh, so we need to remind ourselves occasionally. And now, tonight, we'll have that conversation. What is America's role in the world? How do others uh, from um, around the world now see us? Uh, you know, and uh, I think it's, um, we've got some great resources tonight that uh, can help us with that. Um, I'll go through the speakers so we. You, you have this already, but uh, Ruben Brigady is the dean at the GW University Elliott School of International Affairs. Uh, he had previously been a U.S. ambassador, an appointed U.S. representative to the AU, a permanent representative of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Brian Edwards, a former emerging leader and also a partner of the GPD Charitable Trust is the director of Northwestern's program in the Middle East and North Africa Studies and is an author of After the American Century, The Ends of U.S. Culture in the Middle East. He could tell you all about Shrek and how it's interpreted everywhere in the Middle East if you want <laughs> afterwards. Uh, Richard Wickey is the director of Global Attitudes Research at the Pew Center. Uh, he's conducted and authored numerous research reports at Pew and has written pieces for the Financial Times, The Guardian, Politico, Foreign Policy, CNN, and BBC. Um, this program is complemented tomorrow with a full day session uh, with the Socrates uh, program that uh, will have, I think we have uh, about 15 or 20 people participating all day tomorrow. And uh, Gordon and Carol Siegel have, uh, are here tonight and they'll be here all day tomorrow. So uh, two fellow board members and uh, Socrates advocates. So thank you again for coming and uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, turn it over to you, Devlin. Thank That's you. Good. Oh, uh, I forgot to introduce you. I can introduce myself oh, if you like. <laughs> She's the moderator extraordinaire on page four. I forgot. Sorry. There, there are too many words there. Dog on so. it. Senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, National Security <laughs> Analyst for NBC, MSNBC, really understands uh, where we are uh, in Ukraine and ver uh, in our Russia relationship, had been the Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, and uh, Senior Advisor to uh, you, Evo, at the time, but the Supreme His Allied Commander. His counterpart in military uh, uniform. <laughs> okay. Oh, the DOD side, right. And to the Secretary of Defense for NATO Summit. Sorry, Evelyn. No, thank no. Thank, thanks very much, John. Um, well, I am very excited to be here for this seminar. This is something that um, the topic, American values and America's role in the world, is something that as a second generation Hungarian American, child of Hungarian American immigrants, is very near and dear to my heart. So um, not to get too personal, but I really was excited by the opportunity. Um, I, before I kick off, I want to just read something very quickly to kind of get us in the right frame of mind, which might be a bit depressing. but. Um, <laughs> the New York Times, Frank um, Bruni, also I don't know how many generations removed from Italy, wrote an op-ed on March 10th about Italy and about their recent elections. And he was quoting a radio talk show host in Italy who said, quote, even those Italians who have always been pro-America are anti-Trump. They don't believe that America is as reliable as it once was. And then Bruni writes, and when they look towards Trump, what do they see? An American president who praises and sometimes seems intent on emulating the autocrats of the world, starting with Putin. Trump isn't promoting values, free markets, open borders, and humanitarian aid that bound the United States and Western Europe. He's playing Putin's chest-thumping nativist game. And then the, then the talk show host finishes saying, the lighthouse of all the sentiments that Italy and the United States once shared is not making light anymore. Now the light is Putin saying, protect our boundaries, protect our country. 
So I, I, I say that here because you know we're in the backdrop of just learning that, first of all, the Russians assassinated. We kind of knew they assassinated 14 people already in the UK. But now there are two in a coma, and a third one was discovered this week. We also learned that the Russians infiltrated US energy networks and that they're actually still sitting, to use the cyber language, on those networks, able to take down our electric grid in various areas. I don't even know exactly where those, where those power companies are, and I probably don't want to know. Um, so with that backdrop of sort of <laughs> that's what's going on in the world, those are the other players in the world, um, let's talk about America and American values. And what I want to do is first start with the basics, because I think it's always important to get your kind of terminology and your basics right. And since Richard is really the expert on what Americans think American values are and what the world thinks American values are, I thought if I could throw it to you and ask you, what are America's values, how have they evolved around time, and why do they matter? Thanks, and, and thanks to the Chicago Council uh, for, for hosting us. Um, you know, at, at Pew, we do a lot of surveys, as you said, in the United States and around the world. And, you know, when we survey Americans, I think we continue to see a lot of uh, support for what we would all typically think of as American values. So individualism, uh, basic uh, democratic rights, uh, civil liberties, free expression. We did a survey in, I believe it was 38 countries around the world uh, a couple of years ago and asked people a variety of questions about free expression, you know, freedom of speech. Uh, freedom uh, of, of the media, uh, freedom on the internet. We built this index of, of all these questions put together and ranked uh, those 38 countries in terms of how much uh, each country supports uh, freedom of expression. And the U.S. was at the very top of that list of countries. We had the, the greatest support for free expression among all those 38 countries that we polled. So, you know, we still continue to see a lot of support for a lot of those basic uh, fundamental American values. Um, and we also see that the United States continues to get relatively good marks for, um, you know, living up to those values. We ask a question around the world, do you think the U.S. government respects the personal freedoms of its people? Uh, that number has come down a little bit over the years, but by and large, people still tend to say yes. And that was in a poll we conducted last year when we saw ratings for the U.S. turn in a very negative direction following the election of Donald Trump. So, you know, even at this time when... Uh, a lot of people around the world have very negative opinions about the American president, very negative opinions about American policies. There's still some uh, belief out there that the U.S. stands for certain uh, values. Okay. So now if I could um, turn it over to the two gentlemen who have been doing a lot of work overseas with, Amer with foreign diplomats, with foreign citizens, observing how what the interaction is between our values and the effectiveness of our foreign policy. So starting with Ruben, and I'm not going to call you ambassador or professor if you guys don't mind. Um, <laughs> starting with Ruben, if you could just reflect on whether you think American values matter and what impact does it have on our effectiveness in foreign policy. And, and hold off if you could. I know you have ideas about solutions. Um, um, a little bit if you could just sure. talk about the, sure. the problem. Sure. Well, uh, Evelyn, uh, thank you. And can you hear me okay? Uh, mic off? Mic check, mic check, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. There we go. All right, fantastic. Yeah, great. Mm. Can you hear me now? Okay, exactly, exactly. Um, well, first of all, uh, to GPD, uh, Chicago Council, and Socrates, uh, thank you all for making this possible. Evo, it's great to be in your house once again. And uh, happy St. Patrick's Day uh, to everybody. I should have worn a green tie. Uh, so let me say this. So I, um, I, I would, when I was uh, serving in the State Department, representing our country in various capacities, particularly when I would talk to student groups, and particularly when I would talk to student groups of students who were not American. You'd always get asked this question. So some version of America stands for human rights and stands for freedom and democracy. Therefore, how could you do X, Y, or Z? Pick your, your anomaly. How could you do Guantanamo Bay? How could you exp explain me your history of uh, segregation? How could you uh, do uh, your approach to the war on terror, et cetera, et cetera? And my response was always some version of the great thing about America and America's foreign policy is that you could at least ask us this question in this sense. 
that we are a country like every other country that has interests. But we are also a country that is fundamentally based on its values because America is not based, it's not defined inherently by its territory, certainly it's not defined by its ethnic makeup. America is an idea. And though we may fall short or get closer or farther away from the nexus between our values and our interests, at least we are seriously making that attempt consistently. Not only in terms of how we try to present ourselves in the world, but I'm sure as Evo could attest as well, I have been in any number of policy discussions behind closed doors in the situation room when, when these debates actually play out. Furthermore, there are other countries, like the Russians, or like the Chinese, that make no such pretense of trying to balance their national interests against some broader, more humane set of universal values. And I would argue that notwithstanding the challenges that some, some others around the world sometimes see when we fall short, that this is actually one of our core strengths. That we profess that we are something than, more than simply yet another country whose economy and military happen to be stronger than most. And in fact, we have to continue to press for the articulation of those values, not only abroad, because it frankly is one of the things, one of our greatest sources of influence is being able to convince other people around the world of the validity of these values and therefore trying to support policies and structures which continue to support them. But frankly also, we have to continue to insist on their adherence at home. And this is what is challenging. I don't like the talk so much about um, how we might be perceived by virtue of the election of Donald Trump as president. Because frankly, many millions of our countrymen had very legitimate reasons for voting the way they did in support of, of, of President Trump. I am much more interested in how the rest of the world sees the disconnect between who we say we are and how they perceive us, not only in terms of how they see our policies, but frankly, in, in terms of very real contact. Uh, through our military policy, or our migration policy, et cetera. And I think it's fair to say that that gap is widening. I would be interested in uh, Richard's view. I would argue that it's been widening since September 11th, uh, since we've taken a series of steps that we thought were in our interest in order to protect ourselves. But I think that surely, particularly as it regards our debates about immigration, Frankly, it also as it regards our, uh, the increasing strain under which our own democratic institutions are under. Uh, that the rest of the world is asking, is America really who they say they are? And are looking at other models, like the Chinese, et cetera, uh, and particularly in the part of the world where I work the most, in Africa, this is a very live debate uh, as African countries try to figure out, should they be looking east or looking west uh, in terms of their governance models and their, and their own plans for uh, their own social and economic development? Okay, well, uh, Richard, you're on notice that when Brian's done, we would yeah. like your, your, your response to some of this. Sure. Um, you know, I agree with uh, Ruben. I'll also not call you ambassador right now, but I'm thinking it. I'm thinking it in my head. Thank you for, uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank, it's great to be here, and thanks for organizing this. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 one, of the, one of the things that changes around September 11th that I uh, want to focus on in the part of the world that I spend attention, more attention to, and I'm, you know, as a researcher and a scholar who spends time, especially in North Africa uh, and the Middle East, uh, is the ways in which people are getting images of the United States and what those ideas looked like um, and how they, you know, over the course of the late part of the 20th century and then coming into the 21st century, those images are traveling in a different way. So one of the, one of the reasons I think you're right is not only because uh, that September 11th becomes a turning point, um, uh, in terms of those uh, attitudes to, or towards what American values might be in the world, is that the digital revolution, <laughs> the technological revolution that was coming through the 1990s and really picks up coincidentally somewhat in the 21st century, changes the means by which people around the world are getting images of the United States. Now, John mentioned uh, the title of my, my last book was called After the American Century, 
and the, the idea that we're after an American century is, was referencing an idea that Henry Luce made famous in the 20th century, that the American century was not just the kind of period of US dominance in the world, political or economic or, or military, but also that there was a cultural uh, kind of a way in which America, the popularity of American culture, what would later come to be called soft power, uh, gave an image of the United States that was charismatic, that may, may have influenced a lot of attitudes that people had, whether it was about abundance, whether it was about uh, the ways in which we uh, understood diversity or the ways in which we understood uh, resistance to the kinds of uh, fail the ways in which we didn't lead, uh, you know, uh, get to the place that we aspired to be as a country. Um, but in the 21st century, with the arrival of, of digital technologies, had all sorts of geopolitical effects. Whether, you know, the arrival of CNN during the 1990-91 Gulf War, of course, was very important and leads to the creation of Al Jazeera in certain very direct ways. Um, and now, I mean, just to jump ahead, uh, and it, it certainly precedes uh, uh, Donald Trump's election, young people, old people alike, are seeing very rapidly um, images coming from political culture and entertainment culture um, that give them, uh, uh, you know, that kind of fractured this earlier idea that there was, whether you want to use American exceptionalist rhetoric or not, that there was something um, more positive about the United States. Also, after September 11th, our popular culture changes. If you watch television dramas, uh, if you watch Hollywood movies, if you watch serials, and of course you do, and the rest of the world does, directly or indirectly, or if you watch reality television, we're coming to Trump, and this is an important kind of ways in which our, the forms of entertainment start to change in the United States, and then around the world, there's a lot of copying of entertainment forms. You see a very different um, version of the United States and of American culture than was predominant in the late 20th century during you know, the kind of the Cold War. So one of the things that I'm interested in, um, as I go around and, and talk to people and listen to them, um, in, in, uh, you know, I just came back from Morocco, I'm leaving on the weekend for Jordan and, and then uh, Lebanon, is to really understand what people are seeing. And what they're seeing uh, is you know, images of a presidency that uh, resembles reality television, and this is not uh, this is not my, you know, most, most analysts are actually pointing this out, that the certain kind of forms of presidential power and the ways in which, the, you know, we're, I'm listening to NPR driving down from Evanston and, it's, you know, we're talking about how it's a very stressful place to be in the White House right now. The president, of course, and they say, the two journalists said to each other, imagine if our office was like that. And we're all imagining that in some way. And this, of course, is circulates around the world. Um, uh, so I could be happy to say more about that. But I think that one of the really important uh, and I say this often when I come here too, that to pay attention to the ways in which American culture, cultural products, uh, music, movies, uh, television, which are very uh, pervasive around the world and copied, uh, have been changing and the ways in which our political culture is now right next to it. If you're looking at your phone and following Twitter on your phone or following Facebook on your phone, as people are around the Middle East and North Africa or watching satellite TV, these are layered right next to each other. The music clips and the political snippets are right next to each other. And this is not different uh, in other parts of the world. And it has a profound effect around the, the uh, uh, kinds of questions that Ruben was addressing. OK, so Richard, now you've had the benefit of actually a lot of assessment and analysis from out, out there in the real world. But you have the data. You've looked at this over time. Um, what are your responses to the various comments and, and observations of the two gentlemen? Yeah, no, I, a lot of those, I think a lot of the themes you're talking about we've seen in different ways sort of in our, our survey data over time. Um, you know, as you, I think both mentioned, uh, America's image certainly did change. There were big changes in how people around the world thought about the United States after 9-11. I mean, I think one of the things we saw in our research was that uh, in that era, there were concerns about sort of American power, right? That was the era of the U.S. as the hyper power, uh, sort of, you know, exercising its hard power around the world in, a, in an unconstrained manner. And that generated fears and concerns in, in different parts of the world. The Iraq war was very unpopular. If you look at uh, something like drone strikes during the Obama era, you know, those were very unpopular too. So there's, there's always some, some worries about America's sort of vast power when, when we exercise it. Um, if you look at ratings for President Trump today, um, some of those numbers look a little bit like what we saw for, say, George W. Bush at the end of his term in office. But I think there's some differences, too. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to know what, what others think about this. But 
you know, we asked about a number of different policy ideas uh, that President Trump has talked about. Now, some of those have evolved a bit since we, we, we first asked about them, but, you know, we asked about things like uh, building a wall on the border with Mexico, uh, you know, banning people from certain predominantly Muslim countries from entering the United States, and a lot of opposition to those ideas globally. There's this sort of view that people don't like it when they see the U.S. putting up borders or barriers between itself and the rest of the world, whether that's a literal barrier on the border with Mexico or a figurative barrier in terms of preventing people from entering the country. And then the, another thing we, we asked about uh, were sort of elements of American withdrawal from the world. So the U.S. pulling out of trade agreements, the U.S. pulling out of the climate accords, uh, the U.S. withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal. And all of those were very unpopular as well. So there's sort of this element of, of people not wanting to see the U.S. sort of back off from its international commitments and stepping back in a way from its role as the leader of the sort of liberal world order. So in some ways, I think there's similarities between what we see when we, we talk about so far in the Trump era and how people around the world see the United States, but there's some differences too. And I'll just add one other thing to, on the sort of soft power and, and um, you know, um, views about American popular culture, which we've seen, you know, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people around the world embracing American popular culture, but it, it varies in different parts of the world. We sort of, we've seen a little bit less of it in the Middle East, maybe, than we see in Europe and things like that. But something we see just about everywhere is that, you know, even when you have a lot of uh, people saying, I really like American movies and television and music, at the same time, we ask them a question and, and say, um, do you think that the spread of American customs and ideas to your country is a good thing or a bad thing? And they say it's a bad thing, you know. <laughs> you know so they, they want their Jay-Z and their superhero <laughs> movies and all that sort of stuff, right? But then, but then they're worried about it kind of pushing out their own cultures and traditions. They kind of want to consume American culture on their own terms. Um, you know, that's a little bit of what we see in our data. Okay, so, oh, do you want to say something? Well, I wanted to jump in on that for a second. Yeah, because uh, one, one, of the, one of the effects, I think, of the way the Trump presidency is playing out their um, culture, at least what I've seen in the interviews I've done, in a very different kind of interview, long extended qualitative yeah. interview, um, is that gap between American popular culture and U.S. as a political entity was sustained, like you could, uh, sustained until quite recently, I think. In other words, you could say to yourself, as I asked you know, Moroccans in the first decade during the Iraq war, which was very unpopular in Morocco, how do you justify going to McDonald's? And they would call that a fraught thing. There's a I mean, new McDonald's coming, building in the city of Fez, and people would boycott it, then they decided it was okay. So you know, how, how did you, hip hop music was very popular, then the arrival of social networking, which was understood to be coming from the United States. How would you, how would you justify that? Was that a contradiction for you? Well, I think the way a lot of people would sustain um, that contradiction would say, well, the U.S. is a political entity, you know, it's this, they do these sorts of things. But as a culture, it's very charismatic. And so this leads to the point, but what about the values, right? So in the Cold War, the French called it coca colonization, coca colonization, right? That was a term that Europe, you know, when you push it out there, it's too much, it's ruining our culture. Um, one of the things I think that, that Trump does by, by emerging from uh, reality television and, and his use of Twitter, which in a very kind of, you know, obviously vibrant way, but in also sort of a, a way that people find immediately entering pop culture, whether it's the word kafefe, which I can say, and <laughs> you know the word, it's a typo, it's a word, right? Um, the, the way, the kind of fun with which he, with, with which he, he has it, um, he has doing, but you know, emerging from this kind of pop culture, reality television uh, uh, way is that he's starting to confuse that gap between our popular culture, our forms, reality television, and our political culture. And that actually is quite devastating because it leads to uh, that sense that actually you are imposing something on us. You're impo it's, 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 yeah. Okay, so we have this dynamic that you all describe where right now, um, certainly your polling shows that um, there's a lot of uh, hesitation, if you will, <laughs> to, to put it mildly, with regard to Trump internationally. We'll leave the domestic part to the side for the moment. Um, and so the, the U.S. influence may be not quite as strong as we think in an ideal world it should be. Okay, so let's put it in context. Who are, who's the competition and how does that affect what you all see going on in the world? How does that affect, does it matter? And maybe just starting with Richard again, sorry, and then, and then Ruben. Yeah, just um, we've done a little bit of work in particular looking at views of the United States 
compared to China around the world and how people perceive the balance of power between the U.S. and China. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's sort of how people view that balance has changed a lot over the last few decades depending on what's been happening economically and politically. So, you know, after 2008, the economic crisis hits, people saw American um, uh, power sort of on the decline, China's continuing to grow, its power was on the rise. Uh, as the U.S. economy started to bounce back a little bit, you saw those reverse. But one of the things we saw in our 2017 poll, uh, and especially in Europe and some other places, is that uh, once again people started seeing, say, China's economic power on the rise and, and America's on the decline. And some of that might just be that they, they didn't like Trump and it's sort of that's how it was reflected in their their, um, in their answers to our questions. But I think another element of it that will be interesting to keep looking at is, you know, do people see the U.S. kind of taking a step back from a leadership role in the world, and does that affect how they see that balance of power between the U.S. and China? Okay, Ruben, if you could answer that question, and also since we're running low on time, maybe give us a sense. I know you're working on a book that gives some solutions for the U.S. domestic right. situation because in your I'm putting your words, your words in your mouth, but, but because in your view, what's happening domestically affects what happens in, outside with regard to U.S. influence. So if you can just reflect on that plus the solution. Sure, in 90 seconds or less. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, so first of all, it matters immensely uh, how, 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 how we are seen uh, in, in, in this administration's approach. And let me say this, there are reasonable eminently reasonable differences of opinion about how we should approach Middle East peace or what the nature of health care uh, the United States should be or how we should approach you know, gun violence. All, all that is, is, is within the realm of normal sort of American discourse. What, I, what profoundly worries me is that the president is turning the argument of American exceptionalism fundamentally on its head in this sense. What has made America, America exceptional, set apart, is not that we are more efficient in our governance, it's not that we have an economy that is stronger, or it's not that we have a military that is stronger, because on all these points, the Chinese and others can compete. What makes us exceptional is our approach to individual human dignity, as written in the founding documents of our country, that we have practiced imperfectly, but that we have continued to perfect over time. And as translated into our foreign policy, the notion that these sorts of values can lend themselves to a more shared view of common interests around the world. So when we see the pullout from major trade deals, when we see the pullout from the Paris Climate Accord, when China becomes the rational grown-up voice for global trade, when we cede you know, the notion of trying to figure out how we address climate change to our French friends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then we are truly unexceptional. We are making the argument that when we say America first, why not New Zealand first? Why not Botswana first? We are simply making an argument that we are a country like any other that simply has its own set of interests. And when push comes to shove, when countries therefore have to decide who are, who are they most likely to find their shared interest supported by, it is not simply going to be by those countries that may have a particular material advantage on any given day. It also has to be how we see long range interests, uh, long range values colliding. And let me say this, there is no scenario in which it is in America's interest to cede leadership or seed values on a wide variety of issues that have made our country safe over the course of the last 50 years. So what's to be done? One of the things that I'm deeply worried about is the fact that the hyperpolarization that we see gripping our govern governing institutions is making, it le making our entire model less attractive to others around the world. And we're seeing, frankly, a series of democratic institutions and multilateral institutions under stress and under strain, some by virtue of external shocks like immigration in Europe, some by virtue of meddling by the Russians, et cetera. So one of the things that, uh, so, so uh, Evelyn mentioned that I'm working on a book, the title of which is Tribal America, the National Security Case for Strengthening National Unity. 
And the basic argument is twofold. One, that soft power is a vitally component part of what it takes in order to advance our interests and our values in the world. The second uh, is that we actually have a fair amount of diplomatic practice from understanding tribal countries around the world. It's been a fair amount of my time in government working on that. Uh, and the question is, if we took that substantial diplomatic practice and turned the lens on ourselves, what would we learn? And how could we utilize those lessons to improve our own ability, not only to govern ourselves more effectively, but also to decrease the gap between our professed values and our actual practice? And that, in turn, would then strengthen our own uh, uh, soft power, which would then, in turn, strengthen our position in the world. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ruben. Brian, if I could give you kind of the last word. We're getting close to the end. Yeah, you know, one of the, uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful issue that just came out of the magazine um, called Middle East Report that I recommend, and, and just came out a couple of weeks ago, and they, um, they asked a number of people, I did, did the piece on Morocco, but a number of s scholars and people in play, uh, working in different parts of the Middle East to do a dispatch on what people were saying about Donald Trump um, in that particular country. It's a terrific issue. I, I recommend it. Um, the one that was most striking to me, other than my piece on Morocco, which I also recommend, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, was uh, the guy who wrote about Iraq. And he said, actually, it's similar to what people were saying in Morocco, which was actually a lot of what we are obsessed with here on the day-to-day -day basis, if you're following the news, doesn't, doesn't translate there. It becomes a little bit simpler. It's, They're not worried about H.R. McMaster. Not, it's more, <laughs> he, it's across the board, he hates Muslims. The Muslim ban translated very quickly. There's nothing to be, in Morocco, no one I spoke to, uneducated, old, young, you know, cities were, he hates Muslims, he hates all Muslims. That was getting across. But there was also this kind of creeping, and he's, there's a grotesqueness, uh, there's a style that I was in. This the guy who writes about Iraq, Haider al Mohammed, this piece is terrific. And he's sitting there when Trump is on the, uh, either sitting in a cafe and Trump is on television, and people start calling him a clown. They actually refer to comparing to Gaddafi, who was known for these long, and, in the Arab world, long and rambling speeches and so on. Um, but then this guy, guy says, you know, uh, on the one hand, this clown-like grotesque, it's coming across that there's a kind of uh, image that's coming across that's not very attractive. They say, you know what, maybe he's actually, Trump is actually the more honest version of the last four presidents. This is what comes out of his research. Maybe all of these, the killing, he's just saying what Americans really thought. And the last, it's having this kind of, neg you know, it's chilling, chilling piece because there's this kind of retroactive Recognition, and you would often hear in, across across Arab countries I, over the years. Well, during a presidential election, it's not really going to make a difference to us because there's a certain continuity. Now, that is a chilling, chilling uh, idea, and and it comes out of the piece on Iraq. So, yeah, in terms I mean, of the influence there, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it does open up the question. You know, basically, how much of an impact is this president having on how America and Americans are perceived? Because Obviously, certainly for the majority who didn't vote for him, and since his popularity has eroded further, the, a growing majority of Americans, we don't feel like he represents us, at least in terms of values and certainly not behavior. I mean, even if you like his policies, I, I, I find it hard to find very many people, again, even people working in his White House who uh, like his behavior all the time. Um, Richard, do you want to make a quick comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, to the question of whether he's having an impact on how various sort of dimensions of America's image are viewed, I mean, I think he is, but people still differentiate. I mean, you know, we ask a question about the American people, for example, on our, on our survey, and globally, you know, about six in ten or so still say they have a favorable opinion of the American people. That's way higher than the, the ratings that Trump gets, right? So people still distinguish between different aspects of America when they think about the United States. And there's still, I think, some resiliency in America's image. You know, even, you know, at times when uh, people are very down on the U.S., down on the American president, there's certain aspects of America that still resonate with people. Can I ask one quick follow-up question? Does, does our immigration affect that? Meaning, the people that you poll, if it's a country where there is a high level of immigration to the United States, let's say India, mm. versus one where there isn't, let's say Singapore, does it affect the outcome of, of your question? Well, you know, I guess what I'd say is that if you look at the you know, question we asked about the Muslim ban, it, uh, you know, it was particularly unpopular. It seemed to have a particular impact in, in Muslim nations. Uh, if you look at, you know, where did, where, is Trump, where did Trump get his most negative ratings? Where did U.S. image go down the most in our survey? It was Mexico. 
So you know those kind I, yeah, of issues. I guess I'm, I'm asking whether it tempers their opinion if they have relatives living here. Yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's I think that's an important point too because you know for all of the the image, the Hollywood image or the city on the hill image, the long tradition. People are connected to the United States through family, through friends, right. through various diaspora communities, and this is absolutely true in, in Arab countries. You know, in Morocco, people are worried, how is this going to affect me? My family is in Minneapolis, a big Moroccan population, or Boston. I can't get there anymore. Mm, yeah. This bite ban is going to affect me. And so that, so, the, so the diversity of the United States is not just something that, that we know living here, but that people around the world know because they're, as you say, connected. And I yeah. ask that question yeah. intentionally because it gets to the question about our immigration policy and who we, who we encourage to come to America and who we don't. Well, I forgot yes. my manners, um, yeah. and so I want to say thank you to the other ambassador, or at least there may be more, but the other ambassador <laughs> that I can see here, Ambassador Dalder Evo, and, um, and the council for having me. Of course. And over to you, Rachel. We are going to switch to moderated Q&A. So there are microphones around the room. If you have a question, please make sure that your question is in the form of a question. Um, and just raise your hand, and we'll, we'll get started. Um, here we go. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, as your Pew report that you've kindly distributed says, this is an entirely new uh, the separation of American people, the view of American people from uh, the view of American government. It's always seemed problematic to me because we do elect that president one way or another. He's ours. Um, could you consider downshifting for a moment and yeah. considering American values in uh, sort of the individual or personal level? Um, they've changed to some extent. We have apparently, as a country, accepted um, gay marriage remarkably quickly. Uh, that, you know, was anathema not that long ago. And it, we have also, do you remember when character was a big deal politically? That also seems to have shifted so that we can look at, well, he's, he's bringing change. So let's not pay attention to character. But are there changes that you see in America, in individual or um, sort of street level American values as opposed to what the government is projecting overseas that are interesting from this standpoint? A lot of questions online about what are American values as well. So. Uh, you know, if, if, if I may, um, one of the critical parts of the American experiment is this great radical experiment in a multi-ethnic democratic self-governance. And one of the things that worries me deeply is that it would appear that we are losing our ability, certainly at the national level, to be able to solve complex problems through compromise without demonizing our opponents. Now, in other parts of the world that, and frankly, in our own history here, that has led to violence, extreme violence. And we are not there yet. I don't want to make any, anybody's watching online, I'm like any predictions that we're sort of heading towards the middle of a war. But what is clear to me is that one of the great aspects of American democracy is our ability to reason through problems without demonizing the other. And I also don't want to be too rosy about our own past. I mean, we have uh, had some extreme difficulty in that previously. But it becomes increasingly hard for us to be able to champion democracy abroad if we cannot figure out how to perfect it at home. And perfecting it not simply by the rule of law, not simply by the institutions we create, but also by the democratic culture that we choose to uh, reinforce or not. And when I talk to uh, colleagues abroad, this is one of the things that they, they clearly see uh, that are that we are, not only do they see, Vladimir Putin has identified our social fissures as our, as the, as the Achilles heel in the great American giant. And through the Russian bots, through what would the, the kind of propaganda they, they put out in the 2016 election was designed explicitly to further exacerbate those tensions, which means, in my view, 
that our ability to figure out how to bridge those gaps is not simply a nice thing to do. It is directly in our national security interests, both in terms of our ability to, to strengthen our democracy from foreign influence, but also in our ability to be able to champion democracy abroad. If I could just add one thing. I, I think that there's something besides values and morality, there's also civility. And in, in the readings we have for tomorrow, we, there's a reading from Václav Havel where he talks about, of course, it's, he's not worried about America and Americans. He's worried about the transition to democracy in the Czech Republic and how it's brought out all the, the, the demons rather than the angels in, among the leaders and among the people. And so he talks a lot about the need for civility. And I think that's also an important point. Indeed. And the gentleman in the back. Very nice tonight. Um, my question is this. We are always uh, in these conversations centering about around one individual, Donald Trump. I see him as a consequence of how the Republican Party has evolved. Um, many years ago, Margaret J. Smith in the early 50s said, don't let this party become one of uh, bigotry, hate, ignorance, and smear. With that as a background, my question is this. Is our problem, in your opinion, uh, one of, a, of an individual that happened to be a consequence of a systemic problem we have with one of our, our, Republic, uh, one of our parties? That's my question. Yeah, sure. I know, I, I, I agree with the, the impulse behind the, the implication behind the, the question that, that Trump, I think, is a symptom of some of the changes that we're seeing. Um, but again, both in, in politics, but also in the ways in which we interact with, with politics as we as voters. As, as the lady said, you know, the, the, this was, we voted for him, or we in some, in this great line from Barbara Kingsolver is one of her novels, you know, democracy means 50% of the people are always unhappy. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so but, but in that sense, I don't think he created this system. I think he thrived within it. And as we know, somewhat to his own surprise, I mean, from most accounts, that, and almost trying different things out, and look how it worked. Um, and so, so the engagement with Twitter, and if you read back, if you go back to his first encounters with, uh, with, with the president's encounters with reality television, Mark Burnett approaching him, and he said, when he wanted to do his first reality show, Trump has reportedly said, but that's for the bottom feeders of society. That's not, that's not my brand. But of course, he, he took it on, and he thrived in it. And he learned, he learned how to master it, in a sense. And he's brought some of that to these. Oh, I'm really interested in these open political meetings that are kind of in the cabinet room about, right? It's almost a, it is like a reality show where the final, the, this is uh, Tamara Keith had a nice piece on NPR the other day. Uh, the, the morning of what was going to be the, the public discussion uh, video game violence, which is very interesting. I actually wrote a piece on that I think is coming out in a couple of days on, on he was very obsessed with you know, video, ga video game violence. Some people said, well, this is a way to divert the d discussion around guns in schools and you know, uh, taking on the, uh, the NRA. Uh, but it, he, as she pointed out, as Tamara Keith pointed out, this is like the, the finales of his uh, Apprentice show. What would happen? Right? And he, she interviewed uh, one of the producers of that show and, uh, and said, we used to sit there and be terrified. Where was he going to go with it? But in television, as they did, you could edit it all together and make narrative sense. In politics, you can't. Right? So, so last minute, they decided to ban reporters from that, from that particular meeting. But they posted on their YouTube channel, the White House YouTube channel, the video compilation of video game violence that is supposedly ruining. I had to turn my head away because it's quite violent. It got more hits about by, I think, 800 times than any other video on the White House YouTube channel. I've looked at it. It's terrifying. Right? So there's this way in which, so short answer, I think it's a symptom of um, these sorts of changes that, and Trump is, you're right, is not the one to point the finger on. That means we got to point the finger on ourselves, in a sense. That, I just add, added quickly that somebody studies public opinion around the world that, you know, I, I think we should look at not only, you know, how did Trump rise to power within the United States, but how it, does his rise to power uh, look like or not look like populism in various Absolutely. forms in other parts of the world, yes. too, and you know, whether it's Poland and Hungary or what's happened with Brexit or Le Pen in France or, you know, you can go on and on, right? So, you know, he's, uh, he's part of this broader phenomenon that we need to better understand as well. And a lot of people, a lot of copycats, and I understand uh, 
Mr. Bannon is out there consulting. Evo? Uh, thanks all. Fa fascinating discussion. For Richard and, and, and Ruben and Brian, if you, and Evelyn, if you want to comment, that's fine. What's the tipping point? And on the data side, uh, the 2017 uh, survey doesn't show a tipping point yet. The, the, the difference between the delta between sort of a support for the American people and the belief in the American ideal versus confidence in the United States and in in Donald Trump doing the right thing in world affairs is, is pretty high. It's what, 40 points or so uh, overall over the, the 37 countries. But at what point does it tip? And same, same for you. I mean, we're, we're only in year one and a half, it may seem like a lifetime. But we're only in year one and a half. Um, what I hear when I travel in, in my former places in, in, in Europe is we kind of got how you got to Bush. We kind of thought it was okay when you got to Obama. We really don't understand how you got to Trump, and we will never understand if you keep him. Right. And sort of this, so right. the, tip, the tipping point question is really becoming right, right to the fore. I would argue we're already there. Um, in, 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 in this sense, um, the president has made some really quite extraordinary choices that are far departures from what has in, been in the general realm of American consensus in terms of how we're undergirding its, uh, important institutions like the one in which you were an ambassador and, and, and others. The, the question, and, and crucially, well, I'll take a step back, I think that the question the world is watching is, what will we do to correct this? Not will we elect a Democrat, but what are we going to do to reassert American leadership in, in, in a way that not only supports our interests, but that broadly undergirds the interests of the majority of our allies around the world? Um, and there are lots of ways in which that could happen. The president could wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, my bad, I got this wrong. Let me sort of figure out how to, I don't, could. it's theoretically possible, right? I mean, that's one. Um, there could be an, pivot, the there, magical exactly pivot. right. There, 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 there is obviously an electoral political solution to this. We're already beginning to see some of this, for example, the, the election of Connor Lamb uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, the Republican Party, to, uh, to our colleague's question, uh, could realize that the populist turn it has taken is not only not useful for a long-term electoral strategy, but it's so far divorced from its roots and they have to sort of do some changes. There are lots of ways in which that could happen. But my worry is that even if we are able to self-correct, as we have in many other times in our history, the world will always remember that we are capable of electing somebody like this. And, and this is why I think we're already beyond the tipping point. I mean, like similarly, I was in Asia not too long ago, was having a, um, a conversation with a senior Asian colleague who uh, said, who would have thought that the, Ameri that the United States would be an unreliable ally? And for people that are incredibly sort of polite, even in diplomatic circles, it was a real you know, wake up call and shock. So uh, whether the president decides to self-correct or whether there is a political solution uh, of either party that leads us back both back to where we have more traditionally been, but also forward in a way that helps to correct uh, the challenges we're currently facing. Um, we're not going to. We're not going to. It's not going to go back to zero. We will have a fair amount of repair work to do for some decades to come. Evelyn, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, yes, because I, I want to disagree a little bit and be more of an optimist. Because number one, I agree that the political. You know, the turning point will be if we reelect him, and I don't believe that we will. Um, and I believe that the midterm elections will be helpful in terms of correcting the current behavior, the situation, if you will, for lack of a better word. Um, I, I'm mindful this might be on the record, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and and I, I do believe that the odd thing, the silver lining here, is that Donald Trump has pointed to the fact that we aren't done making America a more perfect union, right? We have to deal with still the legacy of slavery, still the ra ra racism in America. Um, I have an op-ed on that, which calls on um, Congress to just 
look at the problem and figure out what are the options for solving it. You know, doing something to, to address some of the fissures in our society, that's just one of them, but that's the biggest one, I would argue. And um, so that people like Vladimir Putin can't take advantage of them for international, you know, national security um, means, ends rather, um, objectives. Um, and, and then also, obviously, that we can make America stronger. So I believe that we have it within us to, to learn from this, to, to take the, the bad, you know, the, the, the affront that we feel to our values and turn it around and reassert our values and make America stronger. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, just to add one little yeah. different, another twist of optimism <laughs> um, <laughs> on this cocktail. Uh, the, you know, one thing that one could say, and we saw this on, uh, on Wednesday with the students walking out, is that since November uh, 2016, we have seen a reinvigoration of civics. I yes. mean, we have seen students engage, young, you know, high school, middle school kids, as well as college kids, engage with politics, learn more about politics than they ever did. We've seen more people come out to do peaceful protests uh, of all, than people who had never done this before. And uh, one, one of the questions I used to get uh, in Iran, as a matter of fact, um, a student once asked me um, during Ahmadinejad's administration, why, do you not, why have you never had a revolution in your country since uh, 1776? And the idea of coming out and protesting in the streets was actually be, had become quite foreign to the generation, the millennial generation. But now we're seeing, I think this is something to be very optimistic about. I think that what the students did in Florida the, at the high school and what the students around the country, the high school and middle school students, I did an assembly with Evanston High School students last week. I said, you guys have much more power. You understand the technology that allows you to spread your message. Uh, you, have, uh, you have a sense of frustration and, and fed upness um, that can be very positive. So I think that's a reason to be uh, optimistic as well. I don't know what that means towards the tipping point, but I do think there's a reason for rapid change. Well, thank you to all of our panelists, the Aspen Socrates Program and John de Blasio for making this evening possible. Please uh, stay and network with um, each other and our panelists who have agreed to, to stay with us for about an hour. Um, please join me in thanking all of our panelists, Brian Edwards, <laughs> Ambassador Burgundy, Richard Mickey, and our moderator, Evelyn. Thank you so much. <laughs> I know. Was so I was short. looking at that clock. I thought I know. We